Hi guys, it is an absolutely spectacularly gorgeous winter day here in the drought plague wasteland of South Austin, Texas. We have made it to Sunday, March 3rd, 2013. Sunday morning, where all preacher Hambone climbs up onto his pulpit here on Doomsday Rock in the middle of the former Williamson Creek to read from his Bible of the Apocalypse du jour, I guess, of the week. And this will be the second Sunday that I have come to, <clears throat> that I have come to you with one of the, one of, one of the all-time great Bibles of the Apocalypse. This is the book of Lindsey Grant. And the name of his book, as I introduced last Sunday from this very rock, is Juggernaut Growth on a Finite Planet, where he gets right to it. That overpopulation. Overpopulation, when you cut everything down, that overpopulation is the single number one driver of every single environmental problem facing this planet. And it is behind, as he argues very successfully, on not just every environmental problem on this planet, every social problem, every economic problem, every military problem, at the bottom of it all is the global juggernaut of overpopulation. Now he continually recognizes overpopulation, his little evil twin sister, which I would call the uh, other part of the helix, which is overconsumption. But his argument, and, and I agree with it, if every single person on this planet cut their own personal level of consumption in half today and the population of the planet doubled at the same rate of reduced consumption, we would be right back where we started from. And then when it got to be double plus one, we're in worse shape. It all gets back to too many people eaten too much stuff on this planet, as my hero Ted Turner would say. So last week I just read the, I think the first three page introduction. So you could pretty much, you know, being a, a, a doomsday prophet and a preacher of Bibles of the apocalypse, guys, I could pretty much open this book to any random page and read it to you. Uh, this book was written in 1996. We're talking 17 years ago when the population of this planet, I'm guessing, was at least one billion less than it is now. Every single thing in, the, in this book is more true today than when he wrote it 17 years ago. So when the selections I am getting ready to read, make no mistake about it, that everything that he's commenting on in 1996 as he nails it is more true today than it was then. If you're suffering any delusion about anything I'm getting ready to read, has changed for the better. It has changed for the worse as overpopulation and its twin sister overconsumption take this planet to hell in a handbasket. So I'm just gonna dive in and read you a few passages. I encourage you to check this book out in the library or to buy it and read it yourself. But if you don't feel like doing that quite yet and you wanna sit here and let Preacher Hambone read to you, here are just a few passages. Okay, on page 76, what he kind of does is just sum up in these bullets the first 75 pages of his book before he moves on. 
Okay, chapters one to four have outlined the consequences of population growth and rising consumption. Let me list some of them. Human population growth is reaching the stage at which it will be stopped by rising death rates if we do not control fertility. Number two. This growth is happening very unevenly, creating huge urban slums in the third world, the source of misery and epidemics. Number three, it has led to the human usurpation of much of the earth, and we cannot manage it, to the use of energy on a scale disturbing natural balances and to a reliance on chemicals whose impacts on human health and the ecosystems we do not understand. Next, there is little potential new farmland and we are degrading the land we have. Populations in drier regions are pressing ever more heavily on water supplies. Next, the technology that raised yields to support growing populations is on or near plateau and that plateau may turn out to be a peak if practices are not changed to promote more sustainable forms of agriculture. Next, Technology has greatly augmented natural flows of nitrogen, sulfates, carbon, and phosphates, polluting the atmosphere and the water, disturbing wetlands, diminishing fisheries, and degrading the ocean. Next, we have destroyed much of the world's forests with profound consequences for agriculture and climate. Next, we rely upon chemicals and monocultures that lead to the multiplication of pests that compete with humans for food, raising the specter of pest outbreaks and famine. Next, we are converting livestock and fisheries to adjuncts of cereal production rather than independent sources of food. Next, the era of reliance on cheap energy, referring to cheap fossil fuel energy, is a very brief period indeed, yet that use of fossil fuels endangers the future of our entire biosystem, including the microorganisms on which it rests. But there is no way, no way, if population trends continue of supplying benign energy at the levels needed and even a draconian population policy could stabilize the human effect on the climate only after considerable damage and perhaps two centuries. I have left other connections unexplored such as industry and mining, but enough is enough. Let me erect a hurdle here for you growth advocates. To argue against a population turnaround, you must prove not just one of those problems I just mentioned is overstated, but that all of them are wrong. You know, then he talks about there might be uncertainty in one of these, but <coughs> but when you take a look at this whole ugly picture, there is very little doubt, I would say no doubt, about the direction of human impact on land and water supplies. And growth advocates have quite a task to justify their faith, meaning their faith 
in this limitless, planet-eating, capitalistic, economic growth model is what he's talking about. My conclusions may not by now astonish the reader. Show me one of those problems that would not be more tractable, more solvable, if population growth were to slow and stop and better yet turn around the sooner the better to minimize the damage already in sight. Perhaps I can drive my point home by inverting it. What goals are served by continued population growth? I can think of only one. The immediate economic stimulus it can provide. And that is a product of bad economic policy rather than any necessary condition. You got that right, buddy. Okay, let's jump ahead to uh, chapter 6. Right here, paragraph 1 through 6. A conserving state of mind. Okay. Humankind right now, and again, this was written 17 years ago, needs a coherent vision of where we are headed and a way of considering the consequences of technological change much more than we need new technology. We need a state of mind that understands the role of the human species on planet Earth and that seeks to identify the consequences of our activities. An attitude that is given more to reflection than to impetuosity and that puts foresight among the highest virtues. Foresight, yeah, right. <coughs> Conservation is not always simple. <clears throat> It requires a new vision of economic activity that integrates it with the issues that I have been describing. He's now on page 92. Asking of every economic process. What is the overall cost of this way of doing things, including the social and environmental cost? Could another way of doing this bring these costs down to tolerable levels? Would a smaller population help us get there? We need to re-examine our social customs and behaviors. Something is indeed out of whack. We light up our cities at night for fear of our own species and we thereby destroy the embracing darkness and waste much of our energy on a very questionable amenity. Oh boy, a friend once told me of a black inner city teenager who, taken to a summer camp, looked up at the stars and asked, what are those little white things up there. Americans wear three-piece suits or the equivalent in our semi-tropical summers then seal our buildings to keep out the noise, the dust, and the larcenous and then air condition them to make life bearable. And the energy we use helps to make the climate even hotter. It is this point that brings conservation and population policy together. The juggernaut, the juggernaut is not just people. It is a species that consumes at a high rate, often without knowing quite why. Okay, then uh, in chapter 7, <coughs> he looks at diverging futures 
where he bounces around the globe looking at, at, at you know, judging where things are in 1996 at various spots around the globe to try to look at where we're going. Okay. The juggernaut seems to have different shapes. In the poorest countries, it is just sheer population growth unmitigated by rising consumption. Actually, the per capita consumption, as he mentions here, is falling in a lot of the countries. The emerging third world countries are generally thought to be on a roll, but they face the danger-laden combination of sharply rising population and consumption. The most successful ones will be those that have stopped population growth and brought most of their workers into the modern era. I don't know which countries he thinks even falls into that group. Others, like India and China, will be riven by a division between those in the modern sector and the ones left behind. Both kinds will, by their very success, multiply the environmental damage that industrial countries are already generating. Their success will be based for the foreseeable future on cheap labor, and they are already contributing to wage, welfare, and unemployment problems in the richer countries. Talking about moving American jobs to China. The rocket of rising crop yields will probably slow down just as the newly industrialized countries, almost none of which can meet their own food needs, become able to compete for food on the global market. Total world food trade may not be enough to meet their needs. You know, he's looking ahead into the 21st century. The old industrial countries, this would be us guys, face the problem of sustaining high consumption and employment in densely populated societies in the face of growing competition from the emerging countries such as China, India, and Brazil. Their problems, meaning our problems, would be relatively manageable if the rich could just somehow isolate themselves from the rest of the world, which they can't. <coughs> All right, to simplify an enormous complexity, let us look first at Africa as a study of the poorest countries that show no signs of escape from poverty and the conclusions that one must draw from it. Then let us look at China itself, the home of one-fifth of the human race, as an example of poor countries that are industrializing. So I'll just read a, a couple of paragraphs. So he starts out in Africa. I've had many rants on Africa and China both. You know, Africa, if you want to see the way this planet is going in the next hundred years, you look at Africa today. This is how he describes Africa 17 years ago when it wasn't nearly in the shape it's in today. Africa, the desperate continent. It takes strong nerves to contemplate the next half century in Africa. Population momentum nearly guarantees that the poorest countries will become even more desperate. They are in danger of becoming marginal to world trade and world concerns. Well, he might have miscalled that one as I've had in other rants. But in an interlocked world, we, meaning all of us, including right here in America, will not escape Africa's afflictions. Africa is the first region on this planet reaching its population limits. News stories from Africa dramatize the appalling reality of that condition. 
in the case of most of sub-Saharan Africa, the constraints are not absolute, but rather are the product of extremely fast population growth pressing so tightly against present resources that there is little room for maneuver compounded by political turmoil and racial tension that makes it very difficult to plan for any future beyond a few weeks ahead. Those countries are trapped. That's, that's a polite verb for it. Those countries are trapped. Then he goes from Africa to looking at my buddy O. China. I've had more rants about China than Africa. So he spends a long time, but he sums it up here. What is at stake? And again, guys, this is 1996 when China was just waking up from about a 5,000 year long nap. Okay. What does that mean? What does the rise in the industrialization of China mean for the rest of us on the planet? We may see China becoming several things at once. This is how he is calling the unfolding rise of China over the 21st century. Okay, a new and aggressive exporter of low-tech high labor content goods utilizing a vast pool of disciplined and trainable labor and by their competition depressing wages worldwide. Number two, China will become a major new bidder in world food and energy markets. <coughs> There's the understatement of the year. You call that one right. Next, a desperately polluted coastal zone adding substantially to the world's atmospheric pollution and contributing to global warming. Uh, China has since become hands down the number one, the number one contributor to global warming. Almost twice what uh, we're uh, emitting and this desperately polluted coastal zone is that inland city. Can't remember the name of it. The most polluted city on this planet is in inland China. Okay, next. An impoverished, hungry, and unemployed peasantry. Next, which of course that would be a leading to a rising source of migration and a region of instability comprising about one-fifth of mankind. And I will wrap up with reading uh, from the chapter, One World Like It or Not. I'm now to page 144. Okay, and I will wrap up this rant with this. We are one essentially destructive species on one fairly small planet. There you go. At our essence, that is what we are, is one destructive species. We have a shared interest in preserving the habitability of our planet. Do you think so? As companion voyagers in the hugeness of the universe, we must cooperate to survive. I am arguing, perhaps perversely, for a sense of interdependence in the stewardship of a shared Earth, even as I argue against too high a level of economic interdependence. Perhaps the best short answer is that we cannot escape environmental interdependence. We must have learned something from those photographs of Earth from space. 
they should lead us behind the fierce tribalism that has marked most of the human experiences. International relations are not a zero-sum game as they have often been seen in traditional diplomacy. Your loss is not necessarily my gain. We have more to gain from cooperation than from competition. Many of the major environmental and resource problems have international ramifications even if they must be attacked country by country. And he's talking about the, you know, this one world, like it or not, that these environmental problems have gone, gli gone global. Climate change, acid rain, sustained food production, energy, forest, fish stocks, fresh water, we, <coughs> meaning the nations of the world as surrogates for a common humanity, must cooperate <coughs> to preserve our environment if we can and to manage the more mundane issues of living together, resource disputes, migration, health, trade, and finance. We have looked briefly at the terrifying implications if even a portion of people in the poor nations should begin to consume as the industrial nations do now. The prospect of a multifold increase in world GN GNP is intolerable even if it were accompanied by draconian technical measures to limit pollution. Even the present world population, you know, when it was a billion less than it is now, would destroy the environment if everybody lived at the level of the rich countries. The combination of projected population growth and high living standards is out of the question. Environmentally, as the old rich are augmented by the new rich and the numbers of high consumers rise, some combination of fewer people and a changed lifestyle will become imperative as a matter of human survival. Okay guys, 17 years ago, the prophet, the doomsday prophet, Lindsey Grant was spelling it out. 17 years later, virtually every one of his doomsday predictions is unfolding and coming true, although 99% of this planet are completely unaware of the fact for the simple reason they have no interest in becoming aware of this fact because it might put a crimp in their little overfed, gorging at the trough, gringo lifestyles. But that's a whole nother rant, and uh, <coughs> I will wrap up this Sunday's version of preaching from the Doomsday Pulpit, pulpit. and one more time urge you to get Juggernaut Growth on a Finite Planet by Lindsey Grant. I got to get back to the library, so I will come at you next Sunday with some other Bible of the Apocalypse. But for now, old Preacher Ham Bone is going to figure out what to do with this absolutely spectacular day on planet Earth as, uh, as we head into a brick roll at 26,000 miles an hour. Bye, guys.